It's my absolute delight to um, introduce Whitney. Uh, Dr. Whitney Wood is the Canada Research Chair in the Historical Dimensions of Women's Health at VIU. And we're delighted that she is the first Canada Research Chair in the Arts, as well as a professor in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. She's a historian of medicine, health, and the gendered body in modern Canada. She earned her PhD from Wilfrid Laurier in Waterloo in 2016. And before joining VIU in, in July 2019, she held postdoctoral fellowships at Birkbeck, University of London, and at the University of Calgary. Dr. Wood's research explores the broad history of attitudes towards and experiences of pain during childbirth. During her first five-year term as Canada Research Chair, Dr. Wood will continue her research on 20th century birth cultures with a specific focus on Vancouver Island, build collaborations in the study of gendered medical violence, and launch a new project that explores the history of women's pain across the life cycle. Building on her previous work at the intersections of the history of health and medicine and women's and gender history, Dr. Wood's work as CRC in the historical dimensions of women's health centers around the ultimate goal of seeking to improve women's encounters with the Canadian healthcare system. And I would like to add that um, Dr. Wood came just in time to become an indispensable member of the Gender and History Journal team. Over to you, Whitney. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Cheryl, for the introductions. Thank you to the Arts and Humanities Colloquium for the invite to present my work this term and to everyone for being here on this super rainy morning. Um, I'm very happy to have joined this community here at VIU and have the chance to continue my work here. And I'm excited to share a bit about that work with you all today. So bear with me while I uh, do the Zoom dance of screen sharing and we'll get the slides up. So my talk today is called Understanding Women's Pain in Canadian Medical History. In recent years, we have seen a preponderance of first-hand accounts in which women throughout North America have narrated their experiences of being undertreated, misdiagnosed, and ignored in their encounters with healthcare professionals. As Ashley Fetters wrote in The Atlantic in 2018, these true life horror stories have some disturbing commonalities. They almost always feature some variation on the same character, the doctor who waves a hand and says, you'll be fine, or that's just in your head, or take a Tylenol. They follow an ominous three act structure in which a woman expresses concern about a health issue, often a sexual or a reproductive health issue, uh, to a doctor, the doctor demurs. Later, after either an obstacle course of doctor visits or a nightmare scenario coming to life, a physician at last acknowledges that her pain was real and present the whole time. We know that these experiences of dismissal and neglect are, are often, unfortunately, all too often compounded by the race and class of the woman in question. Serena Williams' harrowing account of the birth of her daughter in September 2017, after which she had to repeatedly and urgently insist to hospital staff in her recovery room that she was experiencing a pulmonary embolism after her cesarean section, drew attention to the, wider, the widespread mistreatment of Black women, particularly in childbirth. And the recent dismissal of Joyce Echequan's pain in a Quebec hospital just before her death provides yet another example of the systemic racism that continues to contribute to poorer health outcomes for Indigenous people in Canada's healthcare system. These are the ideas that are at the heart of my first book. Um, oh, um, though individual experiences of pain vary, women's pain is routinely neglected in a range of medical settings. Uh, in 2015, men in the United States waited an average of 49 minutes uh, before receiving an analgesic for acute abdom abdominal pain. Women, an average of 65 minutes for the same thing. A growing body of medical research highlights the importance of gender-specific approaches to understanding and treating bodily pain. But the core premise behind such studies is by no means new. Gender shapes and has long shaped how we perceive and accordingly how we treat bodily discomforts of all types, including pain. <clears throat> 
ideas, both now and in the past, about women's alleged physical and mental inferiority, views that often define women as weak, vulnerable, and predisposed to illness, reflect and reinforce perceptions of how women experience pain. These conceptualizations of women's pain, in turn, uh, justified restrictions on women's roles, rights, and activities. In other words, a lot is at stake in how women's sensitivity is represented in medicine and culture. So these are the ideas that are at the heart of my first book, Birth Pangs, Maternity, Medicine, and Feminine Delicacy in English Canada, that I'm currently revising for publication with McGill Queen's University Press. So in my talk today, I want to highlight medical constructions of female bodies, the discomforts of pregnancy and labor pain in late 19th and early 20th century Canada, and also briefly touch on the often overlooked cultural and personal impacts of these attitudes. While the pain women experience in giving birth is universal, is a universal cross-cultural biological reality, the ways in which women experience these pains, as well as the ways in which they were perceived by physicians and depicted in wider medical discourses are historically and culturally specific. In turn of the 20th century English Canada, the dominant perception of the female body held that white, middle and upper class, urban dwelling women were particularly delicate and sensitive to pain for a variety of reasons. The categorization of this particular group or type of woman calls to mind the 19th century Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, The Princess and the Pea. Uh, here, a prince identifies a young woman as a princess and therefore as a suitable wife because she was able to feel and she was made uncomfortable by a single pea covered by 20 mattresses and 20 feather beds. In this story, then, heightened sensitivity is something that exists as a marker of high status. The arguments and rhetoric that were behind representations of the heightened sensitivity of this particular group of women were inseparable from wider turn of the 20th century social anxieties. Doctors distinguished between different bodies and the ways in which pain was experienced based on various categories, including gender, class, and race. These distinctions were themselves a product of mounting gender, class, ethnic, and racial anxieties in late Victorian Canada. And they went on to further and contribute to these tensions well into the 20th century. Canadian physicians consistently argued that a particular group of women, a group of women described by one doctor in 1875 as the luxurious daughters of artificial life, were increasingly and dangerously sensitive to the pain of giving birth. Doctors were inculcated with these ideas in the often limited obstetrical training they received, and they perpetuated them in how they taught their own medical students. Physicians articulated a specific set of feminine, uh, a specific set of values relating to feminine sensitivity in their own professional discussions and debates. And they were particularly effective in spreading these ideas to popular audiences in the advice manuals and advice literature that they authored. These ideas about gender, class, race, and sensitivity affected how and when they used anesthesia in their obstetric practices. And perhaps, perhaps most significantly, physicians' ideas about female sensitivity and obstetric pain affected how women viewed their own bodies and birth experiences. In short, the idea of the delicate woman acquired special significance during this period of ongoing change. So by the late Victorian period, Canadian doctors increasingly recognized that obstetrics could be the backbone of a good general practice and offered a key way to secure patients for life. Nevertheless, the subject had a limited place at Canadian medical schools until well into the 20th century. While, the mo while most popular medical textbooks stress the need for specialists and general practitioners alike, to be proficient in obstetrics, medical school calendars and student accounts suggest a different picture. Although the quality of instruction understandably varied from institution to institution, professor to professor, and even from student to student, young Canadian doctors routinely graduated from medical school lacking obstetric experience. These ongoing gaps in training meant that professional medical discourses, 
those books and those journal articles authored by physicians who cast themselves as experts in the study of obstetrics played a significant role in shaping doctors' attitudes towards pregnancy, birth, and pain. As the professionalization of the obstetrics increased in the second half of the 19th century, the subject began to enjoy increasing those still limited presence at Canadian medical schools. From the 1860s onwards, for example, students at McGill and Queen's University were required to take two full courses of six months each in obstetrics and the diseases of women and children. Still well into the 19th century to the end of the century, course calendars specified that the instruction that took place in these courses was wholly and exclusively based on a series of drawings on a large scale, humid preparations, models in wax, and the use of the artificial pelvis or obstetric phantom shown here in this slide. At McGill, which was arguably one of the leading Canadian medical schools during this period, it was only in 1872 that this description was amended for the first time to include clinical cases in the wards of the lying in hospital as an additional means of instruction. Mid midwifery lectures in the senior years were one hour long, but these were interspersed with instruction in gynecology on alternate days. Perhaps as a recognition of the shortcomings of instruction during the academic year, summer course offerings available at the additional cost of $10 per class were often focused on obstetrics. In 1890, McGill announced the purchase of an improved Boudin obstetric phantom, providing students with every facility necessary for acquiring a practical knowledge of the various obstetric man manipulations. A description that I think suggests the ongoing centrality of these mannequins, of these models, rather than clinical cases in teaching medical students how to effectively deliver babies. Uh, similar teaching methods were also used at the University of Toronto throughout the late 19th century. During these decades, however, Canadian universities were also placing increasing emphasis on the value of clinical teaching. Both McGill and the University of Toronto stated that medical students had to attend at least six cases of labor, and these schools required future doctors to give proof by ticket like the ticket shown here of having attended these deliveries. By 1920, students at the U of T were required to submit certificates showing that they had conducted at least 20 labors under the supervision of the head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So at least on paper, the place of obstetrics in Canadian medical schools appears to have increased during these decades. Student narratives and external assessments, however, suggest an ongoing disconnect between statements about the significance of the specialty and the extent to which students were actually graduating with, with an ability to proficiently manage births. After receiving his MD from the University of Toronto in 1908 and accepting a temporary position in the rural community of Carp, Ontario, Abraham Walensky recalled being asked by his mentor, McGill graduate, Dr. McGee, what do you know about babies? His response, well, I can recognize them, reflected his self-confessed greenhorn status when it came to obstetrics, but this apparently wasn't a cause for concern for the senior doctor, who recounted his best advice. If you run across something you don't recognize, never let on. Don't tell them you're guessing. Physicians were expected to feign expertise, bluff it out, and above all else, inspire the confidence of their obstetric patients. Though students were required to attend a set number of deliveries, individual comments, including one student who stated that, as we used to say, it counted if you got there in time to hear the first cry, call into question how strictly these guidelines were actually enforced. The 1911 Flexner Report, a survey of medical education throughout the United States and Canada offered additional criticisms, and this report decreed that for Canadian medical schools, the very worst showing was in the matter of obstetrics. Calls to improve teaching and obstetrics in Canadian medical schools continued with perennial regularity throughout the following decades. Nevertheless, well into the interwar period, 
physicians throughout North America were routinely graduating from medical schools without ever having witnessed a birth. In this atmosphere, professional publications, including medical texts and journals, played an especially significant role in shaping doctors' views of the female body, pregnancy, and birth. While we might assume that such sources, based on scientific and medical facts, offer an objective analysis of these bodily states, medical narratives and texts constructed women's bodies, births, and pains in ways that were inseparable from the broader social and cultural anxieties of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The dominant medical rhetoric of the period included increasingly pathological views of all bodies and births, depicting female bodies in general as existing in a weakened or in a disease-like state and emphasizing the discomforts or symptoms of pregnancy for all women. Canadian physicians, however, put forward a particularly pathological view of a certain group of female patients, those who could be classified as white, educated, and refined, hailing most often from the well-to-do classes and urban areas. Though the majority of doctors continued to speak out against unnecessary interference during birth, or what they referred to as meddlesome midwifery, they simultaneously argued that this group of women, the women who made up the bulk of their patient base required heightened levels of care to make it safely through the tumultuous periods of pregnancy and birth. This type of rhetoric was a calculated professional strategy that did much to justify the increasing involvement of physicians rather than midwives in the birthing room. By the closing decades of the 19th century, medical experts throughout the Western world increasingly emphasize the ill effects that modern life had on the body. Physicians like Montreal doctor A. Lapthorne Smith, writing in an 1889 issue of the Canada Medical Record, argued that the bodies of all Canadians were subject to the pressures of civilization, a concept that Smith defined as that ensemble of social customs, habits, refinements of manners, comforts and luxuries that were not enjoyed by human beings in the savage state. The pressures of modernity, however, were thought to have um, a particular and a significant effect on the bodies of women. As Smith and other doctors suggested, the altered circumstances associated with civilization, which saw the Anglo-Canadian woman exchange her life in the open air for the confinement of the house, weaken the female body. These altered circumstances, coupled with the added pressures of maintaining an appropriately feminine and graceful image, particularly during young adulthood, weakened both the bodies of individual women and the so-called Anglo-Canadian race. This line of reasoning was also at the heart of broader opposition to women's education throughout the late Victorian period. Building on the arguments put forward most popularly in Edward Clark's 1873 book, Sex in Education, Canadian doctors argued that the excessive development of the nervous system during puberty and the simultaneous neglect of exercise and physical development set women up for a lifetime of health complaints. Some physicians, including Smith, went as far as to recommend a revised curriculum during adolescence, particularly the years surrounding the onset of menstruation, a critical period in a woman's life. Rather than the usual academic subjects, they argued that education for young women should focus instead on domestic tasks, including the care of the baby, the making of the home, and even the care of the husband with the aim of preparing women to be the best possible wives and mothers and well suited for marriage at the age of 18. These tensions surrounding the education of girls and young women during puberty were often explicitly related to menstruation, another event that was increasingly seen to demand medical supervision and management. Doctors argued that menstruation was in and of itself pathological as menstruation represented a distinction from the usual healthy generative cycle of most mammals in which pregnancy and birth continually repeated one another and were the most common uh, bodily states throughout a woman's reproductive years. 
They also wrote at length on how menstruation could be interpreted by the medical expert as a function of overall health. William Playfair, professor of obstetric medicine at King's College in London, suggested in his popular 1876 text, which was widely in use at Canadian medical schools, that luxurious living and a premature stimulation of the mental faculties by novel reading, society, and the like, hastened monarchy or the onset of menstruation in the children of the rich as compared to the daughters of the hard-worked poor or girls brought up in the country. This unhealthy upbringing, Playfair and others suggested, led to pathological changes that set these delicate young women up for a lifetime of ill health. This ill health had the potential to reach unprecedented levels with the onset of pregnancy resulting in heightened pain during birth. Canadian medical experts echoed these ideas. They framed the seemingly increasing delicacy of the white female body as a matter of public concern. And they argued that the majority of Canadian women could be expected to face what they refer to as real hardships in performing the normal natural duties of wifehood and motherhood and of raising an ordinary sized family. Canadian practitioners engaged in debates over the nature of pregnancy and birth over throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, ultimately concluding that both pregnancy and childbirth were also pathological processes requiring medical supervision, management, and control. This was the case, physicians suggested, for some women more than others, with the class, age, and race of the woman in question having a significant effect on how medical experts perceived birth experiences. This process, the pathologization of childbirth in Canadian medical discourses, was well underway by the closing decades of the 19th century. Practitioners, including Queen's University professor of obstetrics, Kenneth Fenwick, routinely adopted pathological language in their most basic descriptions of pregnancy and birth reciting the many symptoms associated with pregnancy and the onset of labor, and regularly referring to the fetus as the abdominal tumor. Dr. Joseph B. DeLee, an influential professor at Northwestern University in Chicago, often recognized as the father of modern obstetrics, was one of the most vocal proponents of the pathological nature of childbirth in the early 20th century. In the 1913 edition of his popular textbook, The Principles and Practice of Obstetrics, regularly recommended for Canadian medical students, Dalee posed the question, can a function so perilous that in spite of the best care, kills thousands of women every year, that leaves at least a quarter of women as invalids and a majority with permanent anatomic change of structure, that is always attended by severe pain and tearing of tissues, and that kills three to five percent of children. Can such a function be called normal? Delete concluded that his experiences to date had convinced him that not the majority, but the minority of labor, labor cases were normal. He suggested that practitioners needed to fully recognize the pathological nature of obstetrics in order to improve infant and maternal mortality rates. Over the course of the coming decades, Canadian practitioners appear to have increasingly agreed with, the, agreed with these views. A review of the 1928 edition of Delee's text that appeared in the Canada Lancet and Practitioner concluded that Delee was not alone in this gloomy presentation of the nature of birth. The review included the note, many Canadian obstetrical authorities agree with him. Pregnancy and labor are no longer normal processes. In this statement, then, we see the opinion that had been increasingly expressed by a number of medical practitioners, the idea that the nature of birth was somehow changing over the course of the 20th century. The idea that women experienced pain and sorrow in giving birth was nothing new, with Canadian physicians readily expressing the belief that labor in woman was foreordained as a curse. The late 19th and early 20th centuries, however, saw a growing emphasis on the varying levels of pain that women were expected to experience in giving birth. As medical practitioners increasingly suggested that so-called modern women 
experienced unprecedented levels of discomfort. After the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859, medical experts throughout the Western world uh, relied on the language of evolution to describe how the bodies and births of modern women compared with those of their more natural counterparts of previous generations. They concluded for the most part that the suffering and difficulties associated with childbirth were made more difficult by the intellectual evolution of the human race. They idealized and romanticized the anti-modern bodies of women living in the past, and they placed increasing emphasis on the highly painful labors of well-to-do women who were often seen as occupying a higher rung on the evolutionary hierarchy than their working class counterparts. Mainstream medical rhetoric held that such women possessed highly evolved nervous systems and accordingly a heightened sensitivity to pain of all types, including the pain of giving birth. Canadian practitioners argued that the bodies of wealthy women, those in the habit of living luxurious lives and having things done for them instead of doing them themselves, were weak and inefficient, more sensible to pain and less capable of the muscular exertion that was required during delivery. When compared with obstetric patients from the so-called uneducated classes in Canada, these women experienced long and agonizing labors. This group of women, doctors argued, also required greater medical assistance during childbirth. In 1907, London, Ontario physician Jay MacArthur suggested, for example, that the higher the social circle or the greater the culture and refinement, the more unlikely the patient was to experience a problem-free labor. By the first decades of the 20th century, physicians regularly pointed out that in countries in which the highest degree of civilization had been reached, women were marrying and having children at more advanced ages than ever before. In arguing that labor would be exceedingly difficult and painful for these elderly mothers who gave birth for the first time after the age of 26, obstetricians took aim at the growing trend of delayed marriage amongst Canadian women. At the same time, those involved in a growing eugenics movement throughout English Canada, fueled by high rates of immigration in the years before the First World War, took note of the high fertility rates of inferior immigrant families as compared to superior Native Canadians. And here, these references are certainly to what many referred to as old Anglo-Canadian stock and not to Indigenous peoples. In this context, practitioners were all the more concerned about the birthing difficulties experienced by so-called elderly Anglo-Canadian mothers, and they routinely emphasized that the early 20s were the safest period for childbearing. So in much of the medical discourse of the period, the birth experiences of well-to-do and at times elderly first-time mothers were contrasted with descriptions of the confinements and the births of their working class and rural counterparts. Canadian practitioners regularly encountered stories about the relatively painless labors of working class women. One of the most popular textbooks of the early 20th century, for example, included the case of a New York City mother, a near destitute tenement resident, who gave birth while hauling in a loaded clothesline and was unaware that she was in labor until the child near term struck the iron floor of the fire escape. The same volume also recounted the, the, uh, the story of a primipara or a first time mother, the servant of a wealthy family who gave birth out of wedlock and mistook a nearly painless labor for a difficult defecation, giving birth to her child in the pan of the water closet. Some medical experts offered explicit comparisons, concluding that poor, hardworking women generally had shorter and easier labors when compared with the rich and pampered. For women living in rural settings, the combination of physical work and fresh air was seen to have an even more positive impact on birth experiences. Canadian physicians, including Manitoba's Thomas Ponton, argued that the many hardships rural women encountered in their day-to-day -day lives made for a better class of patients and less trouble in labor. 
he concluded that doctors could attribute the relatively easy deliver deliveries of rural women to the fact that such women had, as a rule, little to, or no help during pregnancy, and as a result, were in a better state of overall health when giving birth. In this argument then, the class and lifestyle habits of the woman in question were seen as converging to create healthier bodies, smoother pregnancies, and less difficult and painful births. These arguments went hand in hand with growing public health panics surrounding the high rates of maternal and infant mortality in urban settings as compared to rural environments. Alongside broader distinctions of between the experiences of urban and rural women. The bodies and births of Anglo-Canadian women were, were routinely contrasted with those of their non-white counterparts. In the Canadian context, this meant that the increasingly la painful labors of white women were most often held up against the experiences of Indigenous women, whose decreased pain perception was often attributed to an allegedly inferior level of civilization. In the eyes of many mainstream practitioners, indigenous birth was seen as a natural process, as the bodies of indigenous women existed at a lower rung of the perceived evolutionary hierarchy and were therefore closer to nature. Descriptions like the following included in Fenwick's 1889 textbook are representative of the language used by many medical experts during this period. The savage woman retires, it may be to the forest, and secluded even from her female companions brings forth her child, and perhaps in a few hours is sufficiently restored to attend to her own and the infant's necessities, and speedily returns to her usually laborious occupation. While somewhat similar cases rarely occur in civilized society, the difficulties and dangers of labor are exceedingly augmented as the indulgences and luxuries of life are multiplied. These accounts of the pains so-called savage women experienced in giving birth were fueled by a growing body of anthropological literature available to Canadian practitioners during this period. Ethnographic representations of Indigenous cultures relied on, to a large extent, the same descriptions of so-called primitive births. Taken together, these medical and anthropological narratives became a kind of medical folklore that re revolved around an ever-present emphasis on the supposed hardiness and vitality of indigenous bodies. Beginning in the late 19th century, a core component of this folklore involved a focus on the highly visible and easily differentiated birthing positions adopted by so-called primitive groups of women. This fixation was perhaps best encapsulated in George Engelman's 1882 volume, Labor Among Primitive Peoples, focused on an examination of the birthing practices of those women whose labor is governed by instinct and not by prudery, as Engelman said. Engelman concluded that the, the adoption of an active, semi-recumbent, or inclined position had beneficial effects on the process of birth. By adopting such postures, Engelman argued that so-called primitive women were able to give birth without the need for expert and modern medical assistance. With these images and descriptions, Engelman and other physicians who emphasized these differences constructed a double-edged hierarchy of women's bodies and birth experiences. Though Western birthing customs were held up as more civilized and therefore more desirable than the practices of the primitive peoples Engelman discussed, the more instinctual postures were found to result in, e in easier births and fewer accidents and deaths in childbed. Anthropological emphases on the birthing positions adopted by indigenous women continued into the mid 20th century as medical attention to the role of racial differences in shaping birth experiences persisted. Medical experts routinely emphasized a few key factors when explaining why so-called primitive women were less sensitive to the pains of giving birth. A 1905 survey of Ojibwe obstetrics published in Queen's Medical Quarterly um, saw Dr. L.W. Jones summarize the most valid and logical reasons put forward by mainstream practitioners in the leading obstetric texts of the period. And these reasons were the following. 
the enfeebled vitality and poor muscular development of the woman of today, the wearing of corsets and tight lacing that weakened Anglo-Canadian women, and the fact that such women paid for their high degree of development with a larger cranium in the infant, as contrasted with, let us say, the Indian, and consequently greater pain in its passage through the birth canal. The majority of Canadian experts appear to have taken up this final point above the others, emphasizing the differences in head size between civilized and savage infants in a variety of popular medical texts and journal articles. Some doctors, including Smith, who we talked about earlier, offered the additional hypothesis that civilization had the particular effect, the specific effect, of enlarging the heads and brains of white male infants, more so than female infants. While Indigenous women were regularly seen by medical professionals as experiencing less pain during childbirth, leading obstetricians also argued that such women had the capacity to bear a degree of suffering that would be intolerable to, quote, their more highly sensitive sisters. Physicians made similar arguments about the births of other racialized groups of women. Canadian practitioners were most often exposed to rhetoric that relied on descriptions of indigenous bodies and births as a foil to emphasize the delicate nature of Anglo-Canadian women, but they did encounter similar descriptions of the alleged desensitivity of black women, usually printed in American textbooks. Canadian doctors also argued more vaguely that foreign-born women could seemingly stand much more pain than those of Anglo-Saxon stock. Medicalized descriptions of these differences often relied on analogies that compared the bodies of women and of animals, comparing the strength and pain tolerance, for example, of a Clydesdale workhorse to that of a delicate racehorse. Alongside these metaphors, an increasing number of arguments about the dangers of interbreeding, namely the recurring argument that intermarriage between different races contributed to difficult labor, reflected growing concerns about miscegenation during the first decades of the 20th century. In the years following the First World War, a growing sense of unease about the health of the Anglo-Canadian race manifested itself in a variety of unexpected ways including professional medical discussions about the pain various groups of women could be expected to experience in giving birth. Growing concerns about the need to preserve human life naturally came to center in the interwar period on the need to protect the health and lives of Canadian mothers and children. These anxieties prompted medical experts to frame the relief of pain during labor as an increasingly pressing public health issue. They went hand in hand with growing levels of medical involvement and intervention in the birthing room, including the increasing use of obstetric anesthesia for those women who could afford it. Medical advice literature published and republished and directed towards female audiences con con consistently echoed this rhetoric, emphasizing again the pathological nature of both pregnancy and birth. In many areas of Canada, the majority of births continued to take place in the home until well into, the, at times without physician assistance, well into the 20th century. As a result, these sources of advice or prescriptive literature often existed as a crucial point of contact between expectant mothers and the mainstream medical profession, particularly in rural areas. In a number of these popular books that were published in Canada or republished for Canadian audiences, physician authors imposed a medical voice on the female body. As doctors described the, the many symptoms that women were likely to experience during pregnancy, including but not limited to troublesome cramps in the legs, palpation, palpitation of the heart, heartburn, sickness of the morning, headache, and that troublesome disease, toothache, they cast pregnancy as a particular bodily state that became a medical condition and a time when so-called female troubles could reach new and unprecedented heights. Advice literature largely marketed towards a white middle-class female audience 
also consistently emphasize the heightened pain associated with the act of giving birth, particularly for those women described as the luxurious daughters of artificial life, in comparison to their more working class, rural, or non-white counterparts, who were consistently described as women who live much in the open air, take much exercise, and were physically active and healthy to a degree greatly beyond their more civilized sisters. With physicians readily and regularly emphasizing the disease-like nature of pregnancy and birth for their audiences, it's unsurprising that Canadian women increasingly perceive these stages of their lives as troublesome times. It's impossible to determine the precise relationship between medical language and the ways in which women describe their own pregnancies and births. Nonetheless, as Canadian physicians placed a growing emphasis on the pathological nature of both pregnancy and birth over the course of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, these experiences came to be shrouded in growing levels of fear and anxiety for many white, well-to-do, urban-dwelling women. English Canadian women appear to have internalized medical attitudes about childbirth and pain. In the diaries and personal correspondence that this particular group of women left behind, they narrated their bodies and birth experiences in ways that conformed to prevailing medical rhetoric. Throughout these decades, Canadian women expressed distaste with the many physical discomforts associated with pregnancy and childbirth. White middle-class women regularly described their feelings and their perceptions using language that both reflected and reinforced the growing and ongoing pathologization of pregnancy and birth. In noting that she expected soon to be laid aside, that is to give birth, Jenny Curran of Aurelia, Ontario, for example, wrote in the, in the winter of 1879 in her diary that she hoped her illness would be made a blessing. In a diary that spanned the closing decades of the 19th century and narrated her childbearing years, Lucy Ronald Terrace of London, Ontario, repeatedly referred to her several, several pregnancies as her troubles, and she informed her family and loved ones that she would be ill come the month of an anticipated childbirth. At the turn of the 20th century, Alberta homesteader Eliza Jane Wilson described herself as on the sick list throughout her pregnancy. Like other women writing during the same period, she extended this language and this pathologization to the description of the birth itself. And she recalled that she was taken sick in delivering a nice strong lassie in, the June, in June of 1904. Into the interwar period, English Canadian women, including Vancouver's Gwyneth Logan, who described pregnancy as a troublesome time with its full share of symptoms, continued to emphasize the disease-like nature of both pregnancy and birth. At the same time, women also framed their pregnancies as times overwhelmingly characterized by fear, uncertainty, and anxiety. Women's fears of the pain and suffering associated with giving birth were often accompanied by fears of invalidism following delivery, and in the context of high rates of maternal and infant mortality, the fear that they or their infants could face death in the birthing room. As traditional cultures of midwifery and female-dominated childbirth declined over the course of the 19th century, the uncertainties that surrounded the events taking place in the birthing room became a major cause of anxiety for a new generation of Canadian women. In this atmosphere, physicians' perceptions became the dominant view of the nature of birth. Medicalized descriptions of the delicate female body and the heightened sensitivity of this particular group of women both reflected and reinforced middle-class women's fear of the pain of giving birth and shaped individual recollections of birthing experiences. As a growing group of turn of the 20th century women sought out modern medical expertise and hospital birth to counter these anxieties, they were active participants in the ongoing medicalization of childbirth and the professionalization of obstetrics. So to briefly conclude, the trope of the delicate woman dominated mainstream Can Canadian medical discourses throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 
widely held medical perceptions of the female body held that white, middle and upper class, urban dwelling women were particularly sensitive to the pain of giving birth. And these constructions of female delicacy were underpinned by a variety of gendered, class-based and racialized distinctions that were inseparable from turn of the 20th century social tensions. The recurring themes and similarities that run throughout these discussions suggest that the most fundamental dichotomy in the construction of women's sensitivity to pain was the distinction between primitive and civilized uh, when distinguishing between the sensitivity and pain experiences of varying groups of women, Canadian medical experts defined primitiveness and civilization in a number of different ways drawing on descriptions of the class, lifestyle, and ethnicity or race, or more often some combination of these identities for the woman in question. Regardless of the arguments adopted by individual physicians, ideas about the birth pangs experienced by turn of the century Canadian women all emerged as part of a growing cultural milieu that included potent anxieties surrounding the perceived dangers um, posed by immigration, urbanization, and technological change. Alongside the growing prevalence of eugenic theories, these tensions coalesced around discussions about the, of the threats that delicacy and sensitivity, sensitivity to pain pose to the health and survival of the so-called Anglo-Canadian race. Rooted in pathological views of the female body and the heightened pain experienced by a particular group of Canadian women, these arguments fundamentally contributed to the ongoing medicalization of birth, the greater acceptance and use of obstetric anesthesia, and the increased social authority of the predominantly male medical profession during these transform transformative decades. Thank you. Thank you.